<clears throat> Hello, students. I think we're recording now. So we're going to do this quick overview of some of our Supreme Court cases for Unit 1. So listen and learn. The first case we have here is also one of our foundational or, you know, required cases for this, uh, for this year. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because hopefully one of you or several of you will be presenting this to the rest of the class in more detail. But basically, since it does have to do with this unit, we're going to cover it quickly. So McCullough versus Maryland, this is a landmark case. Um, basically, this, the controversy here involved the creation of a United States bank. And several states had a problem with this. They did not think it was uh, a power that the government should have, and they were opposed to it for various other reasons. But Maryland was one of one such state. And so when the United States government opened a branch of the bank in Baltimore, the state of Maryland placed a large tax on that bank, uh, I guess in part to discourage its existence. And so the president or the head of that branch of the bank, uh, McCullough, did not pay the tax, refused to pay the tax. And so Maryland sued him. So this case was then appealed to the Supreme Court. And the questions they had to answer you see here. First, is the bank constitutional? Can, did Congress have the power to authorize or create a bank in the first place? And secondly, can Maryland tax the Bank of the United States? Does Maryland have that power? So what we see here is, yes, uh, the court and John Marshall is the Chief Justice still at this point. The court rules that Maryland, sorry, that the U.S. government and Congress was within its power to create a national bank. Even though it's not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution, it's not part of their enumerated powers, it is derived from the implied powers that stem, remember, from the Necessary and Proper Clause. So the bank was allowed to exist because Congress does have powers related to banking. You could say, like, borrowing money, coining money, things like that that a bank might be involved with. So it was seen as a valid use of congressional power to, to in, uh, stretch or expand their enumerated powers. Secondly, can Maryland tax the bank? And the court ruled no, they cannot, because this would violate the Supremacy Clause, Article 6, right? And so, in this case, if Maryland could tax the national bank, that would be the state government exercising authority over the national government, which is forbidden under the Supremacy Clause. Um, in other words, taxation is, in effect, a way to exert power over another. In other words, they would, the national government, or the states could essentially tax the bank out of existence. So I think his quote was, the power to tax is the power to destroy. So that was a major, this, these were both major victories for the U.S. government over the states in expanding their power and establishing their supremacy. In this case, with Givens v. Ogden, we have another situation where there's a question as to whether or not a state law would be superseded by a federal law. In more in particular, if you will, more specifically, we're looking at whether or not a license to operate a ferry um, business across um, the New York State and New Jersey lines um, was going to uh, prevail here. Um, in essence, we have Gibbons, who has a federal license, and Ogden, who has a New York State license. And to give you a sense of the background here, a New York State law had given, if you will, a monopoly over navigation powers to uh, two major operators in New York. And Ogden basically received one of these licenses um, as a result of a franchise agreement. And in essence, um, you know, is claiming that he has the sole right to conduct ferry operations um, in, across the Hudson. Uh, in essence, the question presented before the Supreme Court was, did the federal license if you will, supersede that of the state license. And, you know, at the center of this controversy was whether or not the 
federal government, if you will, had sole domain over, um, if you will, interstate uh, commerce, and, and to what extent did that, ex did that extend to interstate navigation? And the court said, obviously, yes, um, that when we're talking about interstate commerce, there's hardly a better example of this than the very business that was at issue here. The sole business here was transporting goods and people across state lines. And as a result, the federal license took precedence over that of Ogden because the federal government had the sole authority to, if you will, um, you know, dictate what goes on when it comes to interstate commerce or to regulate interstate commerce. So it made quite clear then that the federal government's ability to, if you will, um, regulate and uh, issue um, whatever regulations it wants regarding interstate power was rather absolute. Okay, um, this case, you know, in this, and we're looking at some companion cases in, in, in some instances this semester, like cases that are similar to other cases that we are required to cover. So this would be one such example. So Heart of Atlanta Motel versus United States uh, was another case where the Interstate Commerce Clause came into question. Uh, Heart of Atlanta Motel uh, was like most motels and what we say public accommodations, restaurants, motels, things that are open to the public. Uh, would in the South were segregated, but Congress had passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which banned segregation in these public places, these public accommodations. Uh, the owner of this motel sued, saying that by passing the Civil Rights Act and requiring these businesses to open their doors to minorities to to end their policy of segregation, uh, he said that violated. The Constitution that Congress had exceeded their powers when they ruled that they that, that these hotel that hotels and restaurants and so forth had to uh, serve all people and in their practice of segregation. So, so did Congress have the authority under the Interstate Commerce Clause to pass this law in the first place? And in this case, the Congress and the federal government again are victorious. The court rules against the owner of the Heart of Atlanta Motel and says that, yes, in fact, people traveling, sort of like what Mr. Dabble said with navigation on the waterways, it's also people traveling from state to state is also covered under interstate commerce. That, that is, in essence, a form of interstate commerce. If you think about it, people traveling across state lines, interstate, as they travel across the country, they need places to eat, they need places to sleep and stay. And so forth. So therefore, this is part of interstate commerce. So therefore, Congress was within its authority to ban discrimination in these public accommodations. So we see here in the case of U.S. v. Lopez, another interesting set of facts where we have Alfonso Lopez Jr. who decides in his infinite wisdom to carry a handgun and bullets into his high school. Um, there at this time, the federal government had passed a law called in 1990 called the Gun Free School Zones Act. Interestingly enough, um, this effort was spearheaded by um, Brady and uh, others who were in favor of gun regulation, and not, you know, Brady was the um, uh, press. press secretary for Ronald Reagan and was um, caught in the crossfire when um, the assassina assassination attempt took place um, and suffered a bullet to the brain, but survived. Nonetheless, that just gives you a little bit of background about why this sort of effort was. Um, underway. Um, and so the federal government decided to also weigh in on this notion of, you know, gun regulation and pass the Gun Free School Zones Act of 1990. Um, so Lopez is challenging this, or his lawyers challenge um, the fact that Lopez is going to be charged with a federal crime. They're not so much contending whether or not that he's in violation of the state laws, because a lot of states had laws prohibiting guns in school zones. 
But in this case, the government also passed a law in the case of, the, or in the form of the Gun Free School Zones Act. And so essentially, this, the question before the court was whether or not the federal government had exceeded its authority under the Commerce Clause when, if you will, um, passing this law. Did it extend to um, you know, regulating the possession of guns um, on school property? Don't forget that this is not a Second Amendment issue, right? This has nothing to do with whether or not an individual has a right to you know, have guns in their possession, but rather it's focusing on whether or not the law itself, the Gun Free School Zones Act law, um, is appropriately or was appropriately passed or has or, or can really, um, if you will, uh, exist given the fact that there doesn't seem to be a tight connection to interstate commerce. So let's try to understand what the government was arguing. The government argued that essentially guns and gun violence has an effect on education. And when that happens, having students who are not as well educated has, effect, has an effect on commerce. In addition, the government argued that there are insurance considerations and other, uh, other considerations that have an impact on commerce. Needless to say, these connections were rather tangential, right? They were somewhat disconnected or several steps removed. And that's what Lopez's arg uh, lawyer's argument is, is that the, the government here really shouldn't be, um, the federal government really shouldn't have jurisdiction here at all. Now, you need to realize that up to this point, all the Supreme Court cases have pretty much been ruling in favor of the of the federal government and in its expansive and, uh, if you will, ever-growing scope and reach um, via the Interstate Commerce Clause. So if you recall, we've mentioned in class multiple times that the federal government has gotten a lot of mileage out of the Interstate Commerce Clause, right, pun intended. And in this case, the significance of this case is this is the first time, the very first time we're going to see in modern Supreme Court history where the Supreme Court limits the scope and reach of the federal government via the Commerce Clause. Essentially, the federal, I mean, sorry, the Supreme Court decided it just didn't buy the federal government's argument that the possession of a handgun had a substantial effect on economic activity. They dismissed that and essentially pointed um, to the fact that the government wasn't regulating the transference of guns, the selling of guns, the production of guns, um, but instead was simply regulating, in this case, the possession of guns um, on school grounds. And as a result, said and struck down the Gun Free School Zones Act um, so the question lingering here is, was this a, a change that we were going to continue to see the court incrementally put further limitations on the federal government um, as it pertained to its more expansive powers that would come to it via the Commerce Clause? Um, and I think we're going to see uh, in the future, we do start to see uh, incrementally more and more limitations put on, on the um, federal government. Okay, so our final case uh, is, is very similar to uh, the case we just talked about because it's, it's another example of where the states are challenging the reach of the federal government. In this case, uh, as Mr. Dabla mentioned, um, you know, with James Brady, that they passed something that was known as the Brady Bill which required uh, stricter gun controls and background checks to be performed when people sought to purchase a gun, uh, in, many, in many instances at least. And so uh, at the time, there was no federal database uh, with sort of criminal records available to law enforcement as we have now. So they said until that could be established, they were going to require local law, state and local law enforcement officers to carry out those background checks on behalf of the federal government. 
And although many uh, local law enforcement uh, cooperated with this, uh, a few uh, a few of them did challenge this, and one of them was was uh, a sheriff with the last name Prince, and uh, I believe from Montana. And <laughs> there was another companion case from Arizona, and they challenged uh, this bill. And they challenged the fact that it was requiring local law enforcement essentially to do the job of the federal government for them. So can, in this case, they were asked, being asked to say, can the federal government mandate that local and state law enforcement cooperate in essentially carrying out the function of, from a law passed by the federal government? Can the states be forced, in this case, sort of to carry out this, in a sense, unfunded mandate? And the court ruled that it was, in fact, an overreach by the federal government and that these local and state law enforcement officers could not be required to perform these background checks. Again, they could do it voluntarily, but it could not be mandated. And so this was, a, again, a sort of a rare victory for the states in modern Supreme Court uh, history. And the states, so the states won. They did not have to uh, perform these background checks. You can see the Tenth Amendment comes into play that says powers not granted to the federal government are reserved to the states. So in this case, the, the Supreme Court saw no power of the federal government to require states to do these background checks. And so in a sense, it's a victory uh, you know, for those who, who oppose these unfunded mandates. And so that pretty much wraps, wraps up, up our yeah. cases. And so we kept it pretty, pretty brief, I think. So, uh, so enjoy <laughs> and good luck on the test.